There have been Bob Hayes and Michael Irvin, Frank Clark, Des Bryant, even Omari Cooper and C.D. Lamb, and of course, Drew Pearson. Wide receiver legends past and present in the history of the Dallas Cowboys. And there is also, undoubtedly, Tony Hill. The one thing I remember about Tony Hill is he was so competitive uh, all the time. I can't remember a game where he had a bad game. I can't remember a game where he's uh, uncharacteristically missing passes. You know, he was just as solid as any receiver that we've ever had in, in Dallas Cowboys history. Oh gosh, he was blessed. He was a blessed athlete. Often overlooked among the pantheon of greats who played the position for America's team, Tony Hill is nonetheless a wide receiver who deserves recognition. A player whose statistics rank among and even lead his Cowboys peers. He might have been one of the most consistent receivers in Cowboys history. He led them in receptions and receiving yards for nine straight years. That, that's unprecedented. I didn't want to be benched. I never enjoyed the idea of being benched, and, um, and, and that's kind of, you know, what set me aside. I think um, it was a drive, the determination, and, you know, and the goal and the attitude that just made me want to be the best. Hill's road to the NFL began in Long Beach, California, where he grew up sharing the passion for the game with his father, Leroy. My father was a huge uh, football fan and living in California, you know, football started at 10 a.m. on Sundays, you know, and then one o'clock the next game and three o'clock the next game. So we got abundance of football and basically we just took it out to the backyard or to the park or in the streets and essentially, um, my love was the same love that he had, so it, uh, it's uh, been an ongoing, sac ongoing relationship. His dad was in the military, and I remember him pointing out, saying that, uh, you know, my dad would always say, if you're not out there to try to be the best, then why are you out there at all? I always believed, and that was really my long-range goal, was to be a professional football player. I was just fortunate I had a father that loved sports and a mom that required, you know, the academic side piece of it. And so it, it was a dual scenario. So, I mean, if, um, if I didn't fulfill one area, then I'd be benched on the other area. He was a star pitcher at famed Polytechnic High School, once striking out 18 batters in a game. But where Tony Hill really shined was at quarterback for the Jack Rabbits, a program that also produced NFL stars like Deshaun Jackson, Juju Smith-Schuster, and Willie McGinnis. They've had more professional football players than any high school in the country. And so I would say, uh, I don't want to say we're a powerhouse. I just think we're a NFL factory. How about that? Hill would soon move up the California coast, enrolling at Stanford, where he would make the switch to wide receiver. Stanford coach Jack Christensen is blessed with one of the nation's leading receivers in Tony Hill. Hill caught 55 passes during the 75 season, gained more yards through pass receptions than any other Pac-8 player, and turned seven of those grabs into touchdowns. He appears destined to break all of Stanford's career passing receiving records at a school where the pass is a way of life. He would leave four years later with 140 career receptions, 2,225 receiving yards, and 18 touchdown catches, all of which school records at the time. Quiet down a little bit, please. The NFL now awaited. After taking Heisman Trophy winner Tony Dorsett with the second overall pick in the 1977 NFL Draft, the Dallas Cowboys would later select Tony Hill in the third round. He was ready or so he thought. Well, when I came in, I think I was the youngest guy in the NFL, so I was 20 years old when I was drafted by the Cowboys, and you know, I talked way back, but I probably had a mispreconceived uh, notion of what was supposed to be expected. I, and I came in with the thoughts of, I, was, I came in thinking that I was gonna be a starter, you know? I think that I was gonna make a difference on the team, and of course, I was humbled with you know, that, that particular year. <laughs> The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show is presented by AT&T, Texas Lottery. Play the Dallas Cowboys scratch ticket today. It's your ticket for a chance to win big. 
and by NFL Game Pass. You'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full and condensed game replays from week one to the Super Bowl. Coming into the draft out of Stanford, he was injured that last year. So he ended up being a third round pick. And kind of getting to know Tony Hill later in his career, I'm sure that grinded on him. Like, I'm better than the third round pick. And he was pretty good at Stanford, uh, by the way. As a matter of fact, ended up in the, uh, the Stanford uh, Sports Hall of Fame. Not that it really mattered to the Cowboys in his first season of 1977. This was a team built for a championship with pro bowlers and even future Hall of Famers dotted throughout the lineup. It was a tough situation for a first year player. I was a California guy, you know, I was come from a wide open liberal persona, you know, and you know, I, I diff to I, I I think I I was one of those that had a different beach, you know. I was just pretty wide open and, and uh, I'm not sure the guys would tell you that and so to come to a conservative, um, uh, stringent, well, I don't say but rigid coach because he was set in his ways, um, was a challenge. To take three years to get into the lineup was not unusual at all. That probably meant he was right on track. And Tom would have said, if he was a pro bowler when he started in his third year, Tom would have said, see, that's exactly what we believed would happen all along. Surrounded by greatness, Hill played primarily on special teams as a rookie, returning punts and kickoffs, while recording only two catches for 21 yards on offense. But he was still a part of a team that would become a Super Bowl champion in 1977. It was phenomenal. I'd never played in any bowl games whatsoever, for that matter, even being a championship. You know, Stanford, we were always bucking for second and third in my division over there. And so, you know, this was, uh, it was a dream come true. He didn't play much his rookie year, but the second year, he beats out Golden Richards uh, along with Butch Johnson for the starting job. And I'm sure he probably thought, well, I should have had that the year before. The bottom line is that, you know, I was with a bunch of legends, you know, and, and, and I was just rolling, you know, I was just, I was enjoying the wave. You know, it was one of those rides that you'll know, never forget. And, you know, coming to Dallas at that point in time, you just couldn't ask for anything better. Playing with your, you know, your uh, idol in terms of Roger Staubach, you know, that you just, you know, it, it just, it was a phenomenal experience. To say Hill's second season was a breakout would be an understatement. He was named to his first Pro Bowl after he led the Cowboys with 823 receiving yards, helping Dallas to again reach the Super Bowl, where it would lose to the Pittsburgh Steelers. I gave my second ring to my dad because I thought like, hey, you know what, we're going, you know, this is, this, you know, hey, dad, you know, this is yours. Although it wasn't a winner, this is yours. You keep this because I'm going to be getting a few more. And I shared it with my dad. That must have been the omen because, you know, I, I gave you that last ring and, you know, we, we, you know, we went to five NFC championship games and we should have won all of them, to be quite frank, you know, in my opinion. And, uh, and as a result, you know, we never got back over that, over that hurdle. The 1979 season would see the Cowboys become the first team in NFL history to feature two 1,000-yard receivers in Hill and Drew Pearson, as well as a 1,000-yard rusher in Tony Dorsett. For his effort, Hill would earn his second Pro Bowl invite. The highlight of that 1979 effort, though, came in the regular season finale, a winner-take-all showdown against rival Washington. The 79 Dallas-Washington game in December, for my money, still the best football game I've ever seen. So many Hall of Famers on the field, back and forth. The winner was going to win the division. The loser uh, was running the risk of missing the playoffs, which is what happened to Washington. Down to the 20, the 10, he's still on his feet. Touchdown! Cowboys fall behind 34-21, a little bit more than six minutes to go. And in typical Staubach fashion, he brings them back. Uh, they score a touchdown, uh, get it within one score. After Dallas defensive tackle Larry Cole stopped John Riggins behind the line of scrimmage on third and two, Washington was forced to punt. The Cowboys took over at their own 25-yard line with only one minute, 46 seconds on the clock. No timeouts, down 34-28. And Roger drives them all the way down to the field and they get to the eight-yard line, first and goal, uh, there's like uh, nine seconds to go, eight seconds to go in the game. The best part of that 
play is a story that I heard Staubach tell many, many years later. It wasn't the play Tom Landry sent in. Landry sent in a little post pass to the tight end, which he had sent in against Washington in Washington just a few weeks before, and Washington intercepted the ball in the end zone. And Landry was stubborn. He wanted that play again. It was a, it was a 16 pass, and so I, I told uh, Tony, I said, Tony, Make make a good fake inside and go go to the corner. He said, "No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm. He he was just uh, just supposed to be out there, so he wasn't he wasn't really into the, in the play. It was a, more of a strong side play. I just told Tony as we broke the huddle. I said, Tony, make a good move on him and go to the you know the outside. So if someone's dogging you, you have the fake inside and go to the outside. And uh, so it it worked out, and you know I did throw it. Uh, it was I mean it was a good throw and a good catch. Yeah." and he catches one over his head like this for the winning touchdown, which turned out to be the winning touchdown, and they win 35-34 uh, and go into the playoffs. You had the improbability of what they'd done, the legend of Staubach throwing the pass to Tony Hill. It was really, it's, it's still my favorite moment. While today's Cowboys boast a pair of standout receivers in Omari Cooper and C.D. Lamb, the greatest wideout tandem in franchise history was perhaps the dynamic duo of Tony Hill and Drew Pearson. As a college guy, you know, Cowboys is, was my favorite team. So, you know, obviously you're watching Drew Pearson and Roger Stone, but then again, you got your idol there. It's just a natural feel. You know, if you're in, high, in college and you're the receiver, you, you, you look for somebody to pattern yourself after, and, and, uh, and Drew, you know, fit, fit in that category. When you talked about Pearson and Hill, there literally weren't enough footballs to go around for wide receivers. It was competitive between the two of us, you know. I mean, hey, look, you know, and, and I say competitive in a good way from the standpoint that, you know, we weren't wishing anybody any ill, you know, that you don't get any passes, I don't get any passes, is that what are we going to do when we get those passes? Competitive indeed. Some would even call it a rivalry between Hill and Pearson, albeit a friendly one. You know, I strive to, to get that, that number one position over there, and, and I was always concerned because I was behind Drew, and you know, and, and I told Drew kind of one of those things that, you know, again, this is youth, that you know, the only reason he's starting in front of me is it's like when you're at Stanford, nobody was going to start in front of me. And, and essentially he said, hey, young buck, you know, if you want a job, you better go on the other end. And, and, uh, and essentially um, Coach Landry moved me over there, and, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, the best thing that ever happened. Drew was on his way to being an all-decade performer, and uh, he, the, the hierarchy was what it was. Because he came in in 77, and now you're taking opportunities away from me, but you're creating opportunities for yourself, but you're also at the same time making the team better because now we got more balance in the passing game and everybody's not tilted to my side. So now when it's time to go to me, I might get the man coverage and Tony's getting the double coverage over here. Look, Pearson had earned the regard in which he was held by Tony Hill and other players. I mean, Hail Mary had happened and they had uh, begun to emerge as one of the real powers in the league, and Drew Pearson was one of the reasons why. Their friendly competition even extended to off the field. Uh, you know, if anything that I tried to pattern myself off with, with Drew is how he dressed, man. Drew was what we say clean. Every every time I saw Drew, you know, every game, you know, he upped my game. In terms of from the standpoint, I never dressed like I can't even stand. I'm dressed like this right here. I'm coming with Drews and. Three-piece, tie, the fro was looking good. Tony Hill come to the locker room, you know, five minutes before uh, we time to go out, he throws his stuff off, he's ready to go, you know? But I had to get the wristbands right, I had to get the socks right, you know, I had to make sure I got to look in the mirror, you know, the afro, is it picked out, you know, and all that. Then I hit the field. Uh, my, my deal was that, you know, when I came in, I just had to slap everybody fine, but you had to make sure everything was in place. You know, like I said, I mean, he was even fixing the pro before the game, you know, and make sure that it sat outside the helmet really good. You know, when, I, when I talk for our, most of our folks, uh, they'll know that when the fro popped out in the back, you know, the fro was looking kind of good. So, you know, Drew, Drew brought all those qualities to the game. You know, had the wristbands, two or three on there, you know. He, 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 was, uh, he was sharp. Tony Hill didn't care, but he didn't need it. 
you know. <laughs> I needed it. <laughs> I had to fool him a little bit, you know. I didn't have the size or the speed he had. So he would just throw his stuff on and I'm gone. I'm good to go. Of course, in the end, with Hill and Pearson pushing each other to succeed, it was the Cowboys' offense as a whole that benefited. The, the reason there might have been more of a, a rivalry between Drew Pearson and Tony Hill is no matter how good of friends they were, the way the offense was spread around, there weren't going to be enough passes to make two wide receivers happy. One big thing with Drew and I, and I think it really may have made us a better receiver, but you know, we were getting the ball thrown four, five times max in our direction. And so, you know, if it's close, you better catch it because you're not getting anything else. You know, Drew and I would probably go to football heaven if we had to be in an opportunity that we were getting the ball thrown to us 10, 11, 12 times. I mean, I'm just throwing those. I mean, and then catching X amount. We never worried about who's the go-to guy. All those game-winning passes I caught, I never called myself the go-to guy because any play that was called in the offense or in a, in a certain situation, when we broke that huddle, you might be the number one receiver. But if the defense changed or you go in motion or something, you're not the one, number, number one receiver again. So somebody else becomes that go-to guy, the number one guy. Um, you know, he was a guy that when you threw the ball, he was going to catch it. You know, just know your fans and butts about it. And, and most certainly, you know, I wanted to pattern myself in the same direction. You know, I didn't want to be a guy that just you know, make big plays and et cetera. I wanted to be a guy that was dependable. And, and um, you can most certainly say that Drew, and of course, I, and I would say myself as well, we, we were extremely dependable. Drew, they called him Mr. Clutch, and that was the reason why. Tony understood that, and that was the respect that he had for Drew uh, as to why they were able to get along as well as they did. With Danny White taking over at quarterback in 1980 and Drew Pearson later retiring after the 1983 season, Tony Hill became an even bigger part of the Cowboys offense. Tony was our, he was our spark, you know, especially uh, going towards the mid 80s. Uh, it's like he had figured all of it out. And that's saying a lot compared to a guy who uh, came out of Stanford into the Cowboy organization playing good football as a rookie. So here you are, here it is, you know, as we get into the 80s, to me, he was one of the more prolific wide receivers, not just for the Cowboys, but in the NFL because we depended on him so much. In 1985, Tony hauled in 74 catches for 1,113 receiving yards, both career highs, to lead the Cowboys to the playoffs, the team's last postseason appearance under head coach Tom Landry. You know, 1985, some people thought was Tom's best coaching job. They won the division and they weren't nearly the team they had been. Um, and they suffered the kinds of losses that good teams don't normally suffer. Tony Hill may have had statistics because they were behind and had to throw more than in some other years. Uh, and that was kind of a weird season uh, because, you know, not only did they, they throw it a lot, uh, but then they lost these games that it was like, well, what happened? They, I mean, they got wiped out by the Bears, who went on to win the Super Bowl that year. They got wiped out by Cincinnati, but yet they won the division. He was the guy that we had to lean on. Uh, Dorsett was still running that ball. Uh, we still was, were, were doing well in the running game. But as far as the passing game was concerned, that was when they were kind of passing the torch. Uh, it went from... Uh, Billy Joe Dupree to, to uh, Cosby, to Doug Cosby, and it went from Drew Pearson to Tony Hill. That was Danny White's main targets, and you had Dorsett back there toting that rock. So uh, you, we had a pretty well-balanced offense when Tony Hill was, was the catalyst. It was a year that I, that I got a lot of attention. You know, I, I thought it was good. You know, I'd been craving for that, especially when you go towards the twilight of your career. You know, you, you don't want to just you know, just walk into the sunset and there's just no horizon for you to, to look at. And, and I was getting that opportunity there. Retiring after the 1986 season, Tony Hill spent his entire career with the Cowboys. He finished with 7,988 receiving yards, a team record at the time that still ranks third in franchise history. His 51 touchdown catches rank fifth all time. If I look back at it, man, I probably could have paid three or four more years. Uh, but you know what? I'm thankful for the things that I have. Given his production, 
his value to the team over his decade of play. The question now for many is, does Tony Hill deserve to be in the Cowboys' ring of honor? He had a really, really good career, and it was kind of an unsung career uh, that I don't think people appreciated it. Because he was a bad man. He should be in the Cowboy Ring of Honor, and his stats were better than mine. And I wouldn't be going to the Pro Football Hall of Fame if it wasn't for a guy like Tony Hill being on that other side. I was there. I saw it. That's why I think he deserves to be in. Had the Cowboys continued on that successful streak that they had going for those 20 years, uh, I, I think we would have thought differently of Tony Hill because he was that good. Well, you know, the, the problem with, with Tony is when, it, when the Cowboys came in, when he came into the Cowboys, that was their Super Bowl years. And then as you think of Tony, as, as he finished out his career, that's not what you thought of in regards to the Dallas Cowboys themselves. So when you think of Ring, Ring of Honor, you think of guys who have been affiliated with championship seasons year in and year out. I think that's the only negative when it comes to Tony Hill not being into the Ring of Honor. I don't know that it diminishes career, but it doesn't hold it up at a, on a pedestal the way it should have. I consider myself extremely blessed, you know, I mean, I'm blessed that the career that I had, you know, I mean, the, I'm blessed that I had a great family, I had great friends, you know, I come to what I, would, I perceive as, you know, the, the number one organization in the country, you know. I mean, I bleed silver and blue, you know, although, yeah, I'd love to be on that Wall of Fame or the, Hall, or the Ring of Honor, and you know, again, perhaps that may come, but, you know, that's, that's where I'm at. I, I can't ask for any more. The Dallas Cowboys Legends Show was presented by AT&T, Texas Lottery. Play the Dallas Cowboys scratch ticket today. It's your ticket for a chance to win big. And by NFL Game Pass. You'll never miss a game again. Enjoy full and condensed game replays from week one to the Super Bowl.